Hello everyone, welcome to our first public debate for this term. As you will have seen on our social media channels, the motion for today is that this house believes it is right for a liberal democracy to criminalize hate speech. Now, for the purposes of this debate, hate speech has been defined as speech seen as attacking people on the basis of a group identity, such as race, nationality, gender, religious affiliation, disability, or sexual orientation. It typically constitutes the expression of ideas considered to stir up hostility against a particular social group. However, explicit calls for violence have been excluded from this definition. We sent this definition to all of the speakers beforehand so they are aware of the definitions in terms of this debate. So unfortunately, this debate couldn't be held in person, but we still have a fabulous lineup of six speakers uh, awaiting you in front of you. So I'll just begin by uh, outlining the rules of this debate. So the debate will commence with opening speeches from the proposition. The speech will have to be no longer than eight minutes and the entirety of the eight minutes will be protected, meaning no points of intervention will be allowed. After the first opening speech from the proposition, we'll switch to uh, an opening speech from the opposition with the same rules uh, governing it. We'll then alternate between proposition and opposition until all speakers have given their eight minute opening speech. We'll then move on to closing speeches where each speaker will speak in the same order as in the opening speeches. In these speeches, none of the speeches can be longer than three minutes. And once again, they're completely protected. So no point of intervention will be allowed during the speeches. So in the opening speeches and in the closing speeches, when one minute is remaining, the speakers will be alerted. Uh, finally, the last part of the debate will involve opening up the floor, that is you, to an audience Q&A, where you'll be able to pose questions or comments to specific individuals about what they said in the debate. We expect to finish by around 9 p.m. And if we don't, maybe security might end up kicking us out for us. With regard to anything else, um, so one of our speakers, Peter Tatchell, uh, unfortunately will have to be dropping out at around 8.15 because he has to attend a big public screening of his new Netflix documentary, Hating Peter Tatchell. So just before I introduce you to all of the speakers tonight, I'd just like to conduct a rough vote amongst the audience here today as to uh, how many of you uh, vote in support of the motion, against the motion, and how many abstain. So if you could just show your hands for those who believe that it is right for a liberal democracy to criminalize hate speech, that would be, that would be nice. Okay, I'll just give it some more time. Can you leave your hands up please? Okay, and those hands uh, for if you oppose the motion tonight. Okay, well, I think the numbers speak for themselves. And then if you abstain, can you put your hands up? Okay, right, thank you. So now I'll just introduce our speakers and I'll do so in the order in which I'll be speaking tonight. So first up for the proposition, we have Dr. Jeffrey Howard. He's an associate professor in political philosophy here at UCL. And his recent article, Dangerous Speech, won the prestigious 2021 Berger Memorial Prize for the American Philosophical Association for the best paper in the philosophy of law. Uh, first on the opposition, we have Professor Nadine Strossen, who is a prominent American civil liberties activist, currently professor of law at New York Law School. From 1991 to 2008, she served as the first female president of the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU which is the largest civil liberties organization in the USA. In her 2018 book titled Hate, Why We Should Resist It With Free Speech, Not Censorship, Strossen argues that hate speech laws are universally ineffective and that robust counter speech is the best proven way to resist hate. Second for the proposition, we have Professor Stanley Fish. Professor Fish is a literary theorist legal scholar and public intellectual also from the USA. He is currently professor of law at the Cardozo School of Law in New York City. 
1994, Fish won the prestigious Penn Diamondstein Spiegelfogel Award for the art of uh, for the art of the essay for his work titled "There's No Such Thing as Free Speech," and it's a good thing too. Second on the opposition tonight, we have Peter Tatchell. He is a British human rights campaigner, best known for his work within the LGBT social movement. Since 2011, he has served as director of the Peter Tatchell Foundation, an organization working on human rights issues such as homophobia, crimes against humanity, and indeed censorship. Finally, for the proposition, we have Professor Ray Langton. She currently works as the Knightsbridge Professor of Philosophy at the University of Cambridge the first woman to occupy this position. In 2015, she was chosen to deliver the John Locke Lectures at Oxford University, considered the most prestigious lectures in philosophy. Through her research, she's published widely on free speech, hate speech, and social justice. And then finally, to conclude the debate for tonight, for the last speaker of the opposition, we have Alex J. O'Connor. Alex is a recent graduate from philosophy and theology of Oxford University and founder of the Cosmic Skeptic YouTube channel uh, and the Cosmic Skeptic podcast. His YouTube channel hosts uh, an audience of over 445,000 subscribers and almost 40 million views, attracted by his takes on philosophical issues spanning uh, across free speech, atheism, and veganism. These are the speakers before you tonight. And I'm very glad to welcome them today. Um, so without further ado, I think we'll begin, if there's nothing else to add, with the first speaker of tonight. So that's Dr. Jeffrey Howard as the proposition speaker. Uh, you'll have eight minutes to uh, make your case and your time will begin once you start talking. But just before, uh, is there anything that any of the speakers would like to add, maybe correct anything about uh, their descriptions, if there were some uh, inaccuracies there. Could I just ask, uh, what was the result of the student vote? Because we could not see it here. It was a bit hard to tell, but I think the uh, opposition slightly edged it out. Uh, but uh, I think it was hard to tell. What do you think? There was a, that last correct, and there was a lot of uh, swing voters. Right oh, there was middle, a, so a lot of... I think, yeah, there was a lot of people who can mobilize tonight. Yeah, there was a, a lot of people who uh, abstained from voting. And okay. before we start, I just want to thank Shavak and everybody else who organized this and all the attendees as well. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and, uh, could I? Yes. I wanted to give a shameless plug for my 2019 book, The First, How to Think About Hate Speech, Campus Speech, Religious Speech, Fake News, Post-Truth, and Donald Trump. Why, well, thank you for that. So without further ado, if no one else has any further plugs, then we'll get on to begin with the debate. Um, so to begin the case for the proposition, uh, we have Dr. Jeffrey Howard, and uh, your time will begin eight minutes as, as soon as you begin to speak. Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much. It's really a terrific privilege to be here with such a distinguished group of interlocutors. Uh, and as a member of UCL's faculty, I wanted to just welcome everyone, uh, virtually anyway, to, to UCL. Uh, on to our, our subject for tonight. So the legal regulation of hate speech, as we know, occurs in nearly all the world's liberal democracies. And it raises deep and difficult questions of political morality, on which I think reasonable minds can differ. Now, one such question concerns when it's legitimate to restrict speech to prevent violence or other crimes that the speech risks inspiring. I say that this is only one question because there are other harms to which hate speech might lead, which provide distinct rationales for restricting it. While I don't rule out these other rationales, and I think we might discuss them tonight, I think the most plausible justification for restricting hate speech focuses on its capacity to endanger people by creating a climate in which attacks on them are more likely. Now, there are two distinct issues here philosophically. The first is whether we should think hate speech laws are fundamentally illegitimate in a liberal democracy, as many political philosophers and activists think they are. The second issue is whether such ideas are a good idea in practice, all things considered. And I think these issues can come apart. 
So let's start with the issue of whether hate speech laws are fundamentally illegitimate. Most arguments about this issue begin by thinking about speakers' rights. I wanna suggest that an equally promising starting point begins by thinking about speakers' duties. I take it that all of us have a moral responsibility as speakers to refrain from endangering others by encouraging or otherwise promoting attacks against them. So consider a garden variety case of ordinary criminal solicitation as when I try to persuade someone to commit murder because it would benefit me financially. Clearly and uncontroversially, this violates speakers' duties not to endanger others. But now suppose that I'm encouraging murder, not for self-interested reasons, but for principled reasons, say, because I think that God desires it, or because I think our society would become more just as a result. And suppose that now I'm not mentioning any specific named victim when I do this, but suppose I'm just encouraging violence against members of a socially vulnerable group. It seems to me that this remains wrongful, a violation of speakers' duties not to endanger others through their speech. And now consider a vi final variation on that case, which brings us to our topic. Suppose that my speech falls short of explicitly encouraging violence against members of this group, but it nevertheless endangers them by promoting the view that they're morally inferior, subhuman, or inherently dangerous. My proposition is this is that this hate speech also runs afoul of our fundamental moral duty not to endanger others. Now, importantly, this duty isn't restricted to emergencies in which violence will occur immediately. Some hate speech will certainly meet this test. But I wanna suggest that hate mongers take a morally unacceptable risk of endangering others, even when the harm will not eventuate immediately, even when it works its poison gradually, aggregating to create a toxic atmosphere in which people are more willing to engage in and to tolerate violence. Now, it's very common to suggest that even if propagating hate speech endangers people, speakers nevertheless have a right to engage in it anyway, at least in a broad range of cases. So many think that it's intrinsically valuable for speakers to express their views on matters of public concern, even when those views are beyond the pale. Now, I doubt that speech really is valuable when it constitutes an attempt to recruit listeners into an undeniably illiberal doctrine that endangers others. But even if it is valuable, the value of that speech, the value of that opportunity for self-expression has to be weighed against the disvalue of the risks to life and limb generated by it. Likewise, even if listeners have an interest in exposure to hate speech because it helps them sharpen up their own convictions, as John Stuart Mill famously suggested, that interest also is not plausibly assigned anything like absolute weight. Accordingly, my contention is that while the right to free speech protects a huge amount of controversial and even offensive expression, and I think typically forbids the government from restricting viewpoints it disfavors, I argue that this right is limited by a few fundamental duties. A liberal democracy that restricts hate speech is best understood as holding speakers accountable for the obligations they owe to others. And as a result, I don't think it's fundamentally illegitimate uh, to make hate speech, or at least a, a properly specified sort of hate speech, a crime. Okay, now just because there's a moral duty to refrain from hate speech, that doesn't mean that any old law that enforces that duty is itself a good idea, all things considered. And that was the, the second issue that I raised at the outset. And here, I think it's very difficult to speak about hate speech laws generically, since there's such a diversity of them. I think to justify any specific hate speech law, we would need to do a few things. We'd need to show that it doesn't have disproportionate collateral costs, for example, in chilling legitimate speech. We'd also need to show that such a law was necessary and that there wasn't, there wasn't a comparably effective non-coercive mechanism for achieving the law's aims, such as counter speech. Now, I think these issues of proportionality and necessity are extremely difficult and subject to reasonable disagreement, especially since they hinge on fraught empirical conjectures about the likelihood of institutions to make mistakes in the future. And therefore, I think it's legitimate for different democracies to come to differing views on the question we're debating tonight. My own judgment is indeed that many existing hate speech laws have disproportionate collateral effects in virtue of being unduly vague and overly broad. And I, I would say that on this issue, uh, Professor Strawson's recent book on hate is especially excellent. However, I wanna insist that this need not doom to failure the entire enterprise of regulating hate speech, which is why I'm speaking in favor of the motion. For example, it seems to me that narrow restrictions on speech that explicitly denigrates others as morally inferior, subhuman, or inherently dangerous need not involve unacceptable collateral costs. Further, 
given the clear ineffectiveness, ineffectiveness of counter speech in many contexts, especially on social media where hate speech runs rampant in online echo chambers, I think that restrictions on hate speech in these contexts really are necessary to combat its danger adequately. Note that restrictions need not always involve direct punishment of speakers. In our current context, the far more important issue is whether we should compel social media networks on pain of punishment to remove hate speech from their platforms. My view is that we should. A final point, debates about free speech and its limits are often views as high stakes battles between the defenders of liberal democracy who really care about free speech on the one hand and enemies of liberal democracy who are happy to see it violated on the other. But I think what's going on here is much more complicated and we should instead view this debate as just another important and, um, and complex public policy disagreement that citizens can reasonably have with one another. I think the public discourse of all liberal democracies would benefit from seeing this controversy as a quite nuanced and difficult one rather than the fever pitched culture war it has become. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you for that. And uh, without any further hesitation, I'd like to open up the opposition to Professor Nadine Strossen and your time will begin again uh, as soon as you start speaking. Thank you very much. As the title of my recent book proclaims, my overriding concern shared with Jeff's powerful remarks is to resist hate. As a lifelong human rights activist, I couldn't be more committed to promoting equality, dignity, diversity, inclusivity, and societal harmony, the very same goals of those who support criminalizing hate speech. Now, for the sake of brevity, I'm gonna use the term equality for all of these interrelated goals. Far from advancing equality, hate speech laws are at best ineffective and at worst counterproductive, no matter how they are drafted with respect to Jeff. This is an independent reason to reject them, even beyond their deep damage to liberty and democracy by stifling much speech about matters of public concern. For all of these reasons, hate speech laws have been opposed by human rights champions all over the world. For example, in 2016, the United Nations Human Rights Committee wrote that hate speech laws, quote, limit non-traditional dissenting, critical and minority voices and discussion about challenging social issues. And ironically are often employed to suppress the very minorities they are designed to protect, close quote. This predictable pattern certainly applies in liberal democracies because officials there are accountable to majority interests. Hate speech laws inevitably vest enforcers with vast discretion. So enforcement will inevitably be arbitrary at best, discriminatory at worst. That's because the concept of hate speech is inescapably vague, broad, and subjective. Jeff acknowledges that many laws are that way. I contend that this definition is inherently subject to those flaws. Today's definition for today's debate is completely typical. It repeatedly refers to subjective perceptions, speech that is seen as attacking people and that is considered to stir up hostility. Now that's not the fault of whoever drafted this definition. They face an insoluble problem. Let me quote District of Columbia Congressional Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton. She was the first black woman to head the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. She said, it is technically impossible to write a hate speech law that cannot be twisted against speech nobody means to bar. It has been tried and tried and tried. One person's hate speech is someone else's cherished speech. Let me cite some recent examples from the US. Uh, powerful politicians have attacked the message Black Lives Matter as hate speech toward police officers or toward all non-Black people. Others have attacked the message All Lives Matter as hate speech toward Black people. Another example, which has been common in the UK and other European countries is religious speech. 
British and European hate speech laws have often been enforced against members of the clergy just for reading aloud certain passages from the Quran and the Bible. Now, I fully recognize that hate speech can potentially cause harm, the type of harm to which Jeff referred. It can fuel discriminatory attitudes and actions. And Jeff, I would go beyond that and say it can cause psychic harm with adverse physiological impacts and also adverse free speech impacts. Targeted people may be deterred from exercising their free speech rights. So my reason for opposing censorship of hate speech is not at all based on the rationale that it causes no harm. Speaking for not only myself, but also many other human rights activists all over the world, our opposition is based on other grounds. So I'm gonna summarize three of the major ones. Uh, first, hate speech does not inevitably cause harm in any particular situation. Whether it does so depends on countless contextual factors, including how each listener processes it. Many people who hear vile racist speech aren't spurred to adopt racist attitudes, much less to engage in racist action. To the contrary, for most of us, such hate speech ramps up our anti-racist activism. Likewise, many people who are subject to hateful slurs don't therefore feel insulted or intimidated. Instead, they look down upon the person who is trying but failing to put them down. As longtime gay rights activist John Rauch recently wrote, if someone calls me a fucking faggot, I interpret that to mean that she needs counseling, not that I am a fucking faggot. Second, no censorship law can completely stifle the targeted speech. Some hate speech will be driven underground, thus reducing opportunities to dissuade those who utter or hear it. Some hate speech will be camouflaged in more subtle rhetoric to evade punishment, thus becoming more appealing. And some hate speech will remain unchanged or be even ramped up as hate mongers take advantage of censorship's forbidden fruits effect, increasing the attention they crave. Third, the most promising way to promote equality is through non-sensorial measures. For one thing, even the most robust speech principles, free speech principles, let government punish much hate speech, uh, namely, as Jeff acknowledged, when it directly, imminently poses serious, specific harm. If we go beyond that, though, hate speech laws do more harm than good. They constitute superficial, quick fixes that don't really fix the actual problems, namely the attitudes and actions that non-sensorial measures do address. Uh, for instance, anti-discrimination laws, laws against bias crimes, laws against conspiracy to commit discriminatory conduct, such as we are seeing take place right now in Charlottesville in the United States, and also counter speech, any speech that counters hateful ideas, including by proactively promoting equality. Many human rights activists and many in many liberal democracies have endorsed these non-sensorial approaches in no small part due to the disturbing rise of discriminatory attitudes and violence in their countries despite hate speech laws. For example, in documenting these mounting problems throughout Europe, the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance recently wrote that in contrast with censorship, counter speech is much more likely to be effective. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I'll now open up to our second speaker for the proposition, Professor Stanley Fish. As usual, uh, your time will begin as soon as you begin speaking. I propose to set out four propositions that might strike you as preposterous or cynical. The first proposition is that hate speech cannot be defined. Hate speech cannot be defined because in order to define it, you would have to be able to distinguish in a neutral, non-political way, utterances are 
that are hateful from utterances that are not neutral and non-political means that the dividing line between hate speech and non-hate speech is to be determined to be determined independently of any particular point of view. Otherwise, the specifying of which acts belong in either category would be made under the influence of that point of view. The criterion is, or the requirement, um, is that what we would identify as a set of utterances that are hateful would be recognized as hateful by everyone. The problem is that there are no such utterances, as the following example might help us to see. In the United States, there's a church called Westboro Baptists. Its members believe that God is punishing America for her leniency to gay persons by sending her young men to their deaths in war. In accordance with this belief, church members appear at the funerals of slain soldiers and from a prescribed distance hold up signs bearing messages like, God hates faggots and your son is going to hell. The US Supreme Court rejected a grieving father's suit against the church, reasoning that although the message was full of hate, it is speech and as such protected by the First Amendment. That decision has been criticized by those who argue that what church members did is not speech, but action and as action, a candidate for regulation as all actions are. I have sympathy for that argument, but I would make a different argument by asking whether hate speech is the proper designation of what the Westboro church members were saying. Or to put the question from the church's perspective, did its members get up that morning and resolve to go out and produce some hate speech? No, they got up that morning and resolved to speak truth to a world that needed to hear it. They are sincere in their indictment of America's welcoming of gays, and they have reasons which support that indictment and demand the actions they then perform. Oliver Wendell Holmes once said that every idea is an incitement to somebody. The corollary is that every idea is somebody's gospel. From this follows the second of my propositions, hate speech is rational. Those who inveigh against gays or women or Jews or Muslims are not mindlessly spewing venom. They have principles underlying what they are saying, and there is no independent way of distinguishing between their principles and ours. And if there is no definition of hate speech that doesn't issue from a point of view complete with a set of principles, whenever we label something hate speech, we are performing a partisan act, an act coming from a different coming from a, an act someone coming from a different place might resist in the name of his or her beliefs. And there will always be someone coming from a different place. This means, and this is my third proposition, any labeling and regulation of hate speech will be irremediably political. It follows that there will never be a final vanquishing of hate speech only the vanquishing of what some of us consider hate speech now to be followed in time by a swing in the political pendulum and the vanquishing of what some others of us consider hate speech. Fighting hate speech is not a general moral act with the goal of a cleared space where only the most generous and communal utterances are produced. Fighting hate speech is a particularistic act with the goal of silencing those whose voices are loudly doing you and yours damage. So we reach my fourth proposition. Hate speech is what your enemy says loudly and effectively. And that is why the battle against hate speech, as you see it, cannot be successfully fought under the banner of traditional definitions such as this one from the United Nation. Hate speech is any speech that uses discriminatory language with reference to a group or person on the basis of who they are. Then there's usually a reference to marginalized groups. The problem with such definitions 
as many have seen, is that they are so general, fly so high above the ground, that they allow the hate speech label to be slapped on those who vociferously speak out against their defamers. Don't Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan members have a religion, a nationality, and a race? Aren't neo-Nazis a marginalized group? Why should it be open season on them? Questions like that can be forestalled by identifying the persons who are to be protected, which are to be protected by hate speech laws. Jews, women, Muslims, gays, people of color, transgendered persons. But if you escape, escape the danger of overgeneralization by listing those you want to protect, the political underpinnings of your definition will become increasingly apparent. And it will be said of you that you just want to extend solicitude to some groups and leave others to the mercy of lacerating speech, either because you don't care about them or because you wouldn't mind seeing them pass from the scene. And as far as I'm concerned, that's perfectly okay. Because in the end, that's what it's all about. Trying to alter the world, the landscape, include the find so that its landscape, including its verbal and legal landscape, is more favorable than you, to you than it is to your enemies. So I say in conclusion, yes to hate speech laws, as long as they target wounds. Word, as long as they target words that wound me and mine. But isn't that exactly the problem with the position? It comes down to legislating into law the preferences of one group or person at the expense of others. You bet. But that is already what is being done and is being done even when nothing is being done as is the case in the United States where vulnerable populations are not protected from vicious diatribes because we are told to take any action would be to violate an inviolate constitutional principle. This not so benign neglect is often accompanied by an optimism about the long-term effects of allowing all utterances into the mix. That optimism is nicely captured in two often invoked pronouncements by Supreme Court Justice Brandeis. Sunshine is the best of disinfectants, and the remedy for bad speech is more so speech, is not enforced silence. I'm sorry? So your time is up. The eight minutes are up. Oh, sorry. give me um, another half. Give me a half a minute. Oh, I'm sorry, on. the rules are the rules, I'm sorry. All right, um, the only counter argument to this free speech optimism is all of recorded history. Um, and now uh, I call on Peter Tatchell. Excuse me, guys. Uh, I now call on. I now call on Peter Tatchell to make the second case for the opposition. Uh, and uh, as per usual, uh, your time will begin as soon as you begin speaking. I'm very pleased to join this debate tonight and have to say that my instinct is actually to support the motion because I don't support hate. I don't want to see anybody victimized by hate. And I also speak as someone who has himself been a victim of immense hate over the five decades of my human rights activism. Not just hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands, but literally hundreds of thousands of hate attacks over the last 54 years. So I know what it's like, and I can sympathize with the victims. But I've got to say that um, although we know that hate can sometimes fuel prejudice, discrimination, perhaps even violence. That is certainly true. It can lay the foundations for bad things, but it's not in every case. And the causal link is very difficult, if not nigh impossible to establish. Outside of a situation where someone says something directly to your face that's hateful and you suffer some uh, terrible damage, 
Um, it's very difficult to put a link between hate speech and a harmful, damaging action. So I would say that we need to be very careful about moving down the road to legislate the criminalization of speech where the causal relation is not clearly established. Also, of course, as we've heard, the problem with this motion is it doesn't say what constitutes hate. Hate is not clearly defined. We've had before us a definition which does provide some clues, but even that definition is problematic. It talks about, for instance, um, the idea that hate speech is attacking people on the basis of their group identity, but it doesn't define what attacking is. Is attacking a, a criticism? Is it a denunciation? Is it a condemnation? Um, attacking is not defined. And then it goes on to further say that it typically constitutes the expression of ideas considered to turn up hostility against a particular social group. Well, again, the word consider is not defined. You know, what is consider? What does, what does that actually mean? How do we define consider? So I think there's lots of problems here with this motion. And I want to talk through some of them. Uh, we've already heard that, of course, not only is hate difficult to define, it's very subjective. Different people's hate is just someone else's robust criticism. It's also very difficult to interpret and enforce. And of course, when you're talking about criminalization, you are talking about the enforcement of the law. And that boils down to the subjective discretionary interpretation of individual police officers, um, prosecutors, and indeed uh, juries or magistrates. So there are lots of ifs and buts. I mean, I would say that we need to be really mindful that there'd be many instances where people have criticized sexism and homophobia of the Quran, Torah, and Bible, and the opinions of various religious leaders who hold to those traditional understandings and religious interpretations. And indeed, I myself have often been accused of hate speech when I've called out Muslim, Jewish, and Christian leaders who have opposed human rights, who have condemned the rights of women to control their own bodies, who've uh, called for the criminalization and worse of LGBT plus people. Um, I don't believe that I was in those circumstances stirring up hate. But some people believe that I was. Some religious people say I was stirring up hate, that I was uttering words that would cause them harm and damage. Well, in fact, I would say what I was doing was exposing and challenging their religious hatred towards women and LGBTs. We also have an additional problem because we live in a very sensitive, censorious era where robust factual criticism is often deemed to be hate speech. Um, so if I criticize a religious person's uh, irrational, superstitious and prejudiced opinions, uh, that will often be misconstrued and mislabeled as hate speech, at least by some people. People can be branded as propagators of hate speech, even if that was not their intention. So recently, for example, some people have been condemned for hate speech for misgendering trans and non-binary people, even though it was not their intention, even though they did not know person X was uh, non-binary or trans. It was entirely accidental and, and unintentional. Yet this definition and this uh, motion does not take into account intentionality. Did a person intend to cause hate speech? Um, people have also been condemned as hate speakers for, for example, supporting LGBT plus conversion therapy or opposing LGBT plus education in schools. Now, I think that it's very dangerous to uh, declare that those views are hate speech, particularly if it was expressed calmly, politely, 
uh, without anger or intimidation. Yet within the motion we have before us and the definition we have before us, it is quite possible that these utterances could be construed as hate speech. So for the moment, so far, the proposers of the motion have not to my satisfaction uh, defined hate or the threshold at which hate should merit criminalization. Um, I mentioned the flaws in the motion that we were given before the debate. It is problematic. And when you get in a problematic area, the best thing is not to barge forward and go ahead regardless. The best option, the safest option, is to row back, to at least think about qualifying and amplifying the motion, the idea, the proposal. But the proposers and the motion do not do that. I just want to finish by reiterating that criminalizing hate speech does not make it go away. It may suppress it, but it doesn't defeat it. You know, criminalization is a very blunt instrument. It won't change hearts and minds. And if we want to live together in a more inclusive, caring, compassionate society, we have to change hearts and minds. We have to challenge that hate by showing why it's wrong, by producing the counter arguments and the counter evidence. That's the way in which we undermine hate. We undermine it not just in terms of the letter of the law, but in the hearts and minds that of people. Thank you. Thank you. And I now invite Professor Wei Langton to make the final opening uh, speech for the proposition. And once again, your time will begin as soon as you start speaking. Thank you very much. I'm gonna begin by saying we already uh, have laws that restrict and prohibit hate speech. And that's because we are signed up to the United Nation Convention, which says that state parties condemn all propaganda and all organizations which are based on ideas or theories of superiority of one race or group of persons of one color or ethnic origin, and shall declare an offense punishable by law, all dissemination of ideas based on racial superiority or hatred. Um, and then it goes on a bit further. Um, that UN uh, call to state members is describing hate speech as propaganda. There's another very important idea about hate speech where hate speech is des described as an assault or as assault-like, and that picks up on the attack part of the definition that we were given. Hate speech of this kind has been described famously by critical race theorists as words that wound, and Stanley Fish picked up that idea. It was Richard Delgado who I think described hate speech as words that wound. And Mari Matsuda, in the same famous collection about hate speech, takes hate speech to have a message of racial inferiority that is directed against a historically oppressed group and is persecutory, hateful, and degrading. So I'm beginning by saying, first of all, we are already signed up to the motion uh, through our endorsement as a state party to this UN uh, convention and also that there are two kinds of hate speech and they've both been in the background of our discussion so far. Part of the reason for the um, the United Nations drawing up this convention was because of the history that happened beforehand. The It came into force in 1969 and most democracies have some version um, where they are implementing it. The prior history, of course, um, included many examples of speech that stirred up hostility against a particular social group in terms of the definition we've been given. Julius Streicher was the publisher of Der Sturmer in 30s and 40s Germany. In 1934, he published a drawing of Jews extracting blood from the corpses of children, one of a series which propagated the blood libel that Christian children were ongoing targets of ritual murder. In a variety of publications, he compared the Jew to a mongrel dog, a supplanting cuckoo, a hyena, a deceptive chameleon, a blood-sucking bedbug, a poisonous snake, a tapeworm, and a deadly bacterium. He advocated a holy hate, 
publishing an essay with that title in 1943, which included these words, the devilish hatred of the Jews plunged the world into war, need and misery. Our holy hate will bring us victory and save all of mankind. Stryker published stories for children, including one called Dare Gift Pilts, which means the poisonous toadstool. A mother and her little son are looking for mushrooms in the forest. She says, just as it's often hard to tell a toadstool from an edible mushroom, so too it is often very hard to recognize the Jew as a swindler and a criminal, the mother says to the son. So I'm supporting the motion that it is right for a liberal democracy to criminalize hate speech of this kind. First of all, we already do criminalize certain forms of hate speech. Um, and what I've done is give you some examples of the kind of speech that inspired the UN Convention and its speech that dehumanizes, that silences, that legitimizes violences, violence without necessarily explicit call for violence. Notice that the examples I mentioned don't explicitly call for violence. That's excluded by the definition we've been given. They tell lies, they dehumanize through the comparison to animals, contemptible animals like the mongrel dog, dangerous animals like the snake and the tapeworm, annoying animals like the bed bug, deceiving animals like the chameleon and the cuckoo. They stir up fearful hatred, contemptuous hatred, they silence counter speech through the destruction of credibility. Although they didn't explicitly call for violence, they stirred up violent hatred and the harm in strikers hate speech was held to be a capital offense at the Nuremberg trials. Shortly before Stryker began publishing, Louis Brandeis gave a famous answer to the question, what should we do about evil speech? He said in 1927, if there be time to expose through discussion the falsehoods and fallacies, to avert the evil by the processes of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. The conditions that Brandeis described didn't, of course, hold in Germany in the 30s and 40s. The falsehoods and fallacies in Der Sturme couldn't be exposed through discussion. Who would do the exposing? The propaganda didn't only attack the humanity of Jewish people, it didn't only spread lies and fear, it attacked credibility. It silenced them. Look out, the toadstool looks just like the healthy mushroom, but it's deadly. They look just like us, but they are animals, they are poison, they are death to our people. What then of the inspiring hope which Brandeis expressed? Let's agree with Brandeis that if conditions are in place for a remedy, we should avoid enforced silence. But are the conditions in place? Our conditions are very different to 30s Germany, thankfully. But are they really the truth conducive conditions that Brandeis imagined? Tribalism walls off one group from another in online echo chambers that exclude dissent. Words that wound, hate speech scrawled on walls and sidewalks. These are not invitations to conversation. As Jeremy Waldron has argued, they're effectively instructions to get out. It's not clear that instructions to get out should be covered by a free speech principle anyway. Graffiti sprayed on walls, Muslims and 9-11, fucking terrorists, we don't want your kind here, get out. Hate speech smolders and spreads through internet pathways that exclude exposure or critique. Remember that Brandeis said, if there be time to expose through discussion the falsehood and fallacies, the remedy is more speech, not enforced silence. Well, we can reverse engineer Brandeis. If the conditions to remedy the evils of hate speech do not hold, then silence would have to be enforced. That would be bad. But if the conditions don't hold, what is the alternative? Brandeis himself gives us the resources to reaffirm our commitment to the UN Convention. We ought to do our best to create the conditions, but until such time as hate speech can be remedied through exposure, through discussion of falsehood and fallacies, the averting of evil by the processes of education, it is right for a liberal democracy to criminalize hate speech. Thank you. Thank you for that. We now move on to our final speaker for the opposition to make his opening speech. I turn to Alex O'Connor. And uh, once again, your time will begin as soon as you begin to speak. Well, thank you. Uh, hoping everybody can hear me. Yes, I want to begin with, with a fairly, I guess, straightforward question that I don't think has been given its due yet, which is who's going to be the arbiter 
of all of this, proposing this idea that there will be hate speech laws that will uh, criminalize particular expressions of particular ideas. Who's going to do the listening to determine what the rest of us are able to listen to? Who's it going to be? And seriously, I don't think that we've really heard a suggestion so far this evening from the proposition. And I'm absolutely bemused that we haven't done since this is surely the first question to ask. I presume it will be the government, of course, but we must determine what kind of person is appropriate to fulfill this particular office, who is well-tempered enough, who is intelligent enough, unbiased enough to make that decision on our behalf. Does anybody have a contender? I'm looking forward to hearing one. I don't much trust the government to do a great deal of things, let alone controlling the flow of information. And bear in mind what we're saying of such a person, even if such a person can be found, that there are certain speech that we should not be permitted to listen to, but this person can hear it. For this person, it's fine. They get to hear that information and decide whether it's good enough, uh, good enough for the rest of us to hear. Remember that if all goes to plan, we won't, by design, even be able to hear what it is that this person or group of persons restrict from us. And so we better have the utmost faith in them. And this point of almost inhuman faith is especially important. You may say I'm being a bit hyperbolic, that the proposition are only asking for hate speech specifically to be restricted, nothing further. Well, I have to say I envy the optimism involved in thinking that our government will faithfully reside within this particular prerogative without potentially stretching beyond it when it benefits them politically. Who has or possibly could have this kind of faith in the government. I do want to stress, however, that this is not a moral point about the uh, content of hate speech itself. Expressions of vulgar hatred based on immutable characteristics disturbs me just as much as it should and does disturb anybody else. An opposition to criminalizing this kind of vile speech should not be confused with a lack of moral opposition to such speech. But I want to briefly question whether it's uh, historically a good idea, perhaps, to criminalize certain expressions based on a moral opposition to those expressions. It assumes that we have a kind of moral clairvoyance, or even worse, trusts that whoever we elect to make the decisions on our behalf possess this kind of omnipotence. I draw your attention to, for instance, the index uh, Librorum Prohibitorum, or the Catholic Church's index of prohibited books. This is a published index of those books considered contrary to morality, which the Catholic Church therefore banned. This index contains such eccentric, deeply offensive writers as Descartes, Immanuel Kant, David Hume, John Milton, Blaise Pascal, and of course, Copernicus and Galileo. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, if you're looking for a fantastic list of book recommendations, here is a wonderful place that you can go. Now, this index sounds like something anachronistic, and it is. It began in the 16th century, but this index was still publishing and still prohibiting well into the second half of the 20th century. Now, what's changed? What's changed? There was a point where perhaps a majority of people agreed with the church's specification of a great deal of these texts as being contrary to morality. And guess what? We've worked it out now. We don't have the same kind of moral blind spots. We, for the first time in human history, have developed an objectively true morality that allows us to decide not just which speech is permitted to be, uh, permitted to be spoken, but which speech is permitted to be heard. Again, who do you elect to make this decision for you? Who gets to decide what you're allowed to read and what you're allowed to listen to? I can't wait to hear a proper suggestion. And I don't think we can even begin to have a serious conversation about the ethics of hate speech laws until such a suggestion is put forward. My colleague this evening, Peter Tatchell, has observed that if we criminalize hate speech, we will make it more difficult to criticize religious bigotry. But I want to provide an addendum to this. It would also empower anti-religious bigots to silence religion itself. Hate speech laws would no doubt include, for instance, a prohibition on homophobic material. But suppose I were to stand in the street and quote the Old Testament in proclaiming that homosexuals have committed an abomination and ought to be stoned. Will such laws justify the banning of the Old Testament on this grounds? And if not, why not? In other words, a religious person who wishes to hide behind hate speech laws to protect themselves from hatred of their faith should be careful what they wish for and ask themselves to whom they will turn for protection when it's they that are being accused of speaking hatefully. Uh, Dr. Howard this evening has argued that current hate speech laws are vague and lead to collateral issues, uh, but that in principle, laws with a much narrower set of restrictions may be created and, and justifiably uh, uh, installed. What was his first example of such a narrow restriction? Speech that designates others as, quote, 
morally inferior. This is an example of a narrow restriction, speech that designates someone as morally inferior. What then do we say of Leviticus and Exodus and its condemnation of uh, as morally corrupt of homosexuals? What do we say of academic philosophers in the field of practical ethics who want to freely discuss what gives human beings moral worth and how we might determine who is worth saving in a trolley problem type scenario based on their respective moral worth? Dr. Howard may be right that in principle, we can design narrow enough laws that uh, leave us with no ambiguity here. My response to this is rather simple. Go on then, tell us, because I don't think that the example just given, the one that, the, the one that I've picked here to be discussed, works. And until we can find one that does, um, I struggle to think that this is a good justification for, for uh, bringing about hate speech laws. I also want to briefly mention um, that Stanley Fish invoked Oliver Wendell Holmes, who is responsible for perhaps, um, who's also responsible perhaps one of the most famous quotes in the history of free speech restriction, that of shouting fire in a crowded theater. It's often said that that's an example of one of the things you can't do. Um, a lot of people forget or don't know that uh, in doing so, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes was convicting the secretary of the Socialist Party of America for no other crime than distributing Yiddish pamphlets opposing the US's involvement in the First World War. Now, the fire in the crowded theater thing sounds convincing, right? That sounds, yeah, yeah, that is a probably pretty, pretty uh, bad thing to say and something we could probably be better off without and is indeed immoral. Um, and if we could in some utopian society ban it, maybe we'd want to. But careful how these examples of obvious immoralities are quickly used by the government to justify the restriction of speech in areas that we would not consider to be even immoral, let alone obviously immoral. And that's what I would say in response to discussions of protesters at funerals by the Westboro Baptist Church. Sure, that is bad. It's disgusting. I'm just as disgusted as anybody else. But I promise you, that's not the only kind of speech that will end up being prohibited by these kinds of laws. Five seconds is not really much time to say anything else. So I'll just say thanks for listening. We'll now move on to closing remarks from each speaker. But I'm aware that uh, Mr. Tatchell has to leave at quarter past eight. So unless any further speaker has an objection, um, I'd like to ask if Peter would like to make his closing remarks first. If you have an objection, please raise it. And Peter, if you don't want the opportunity, please say so. I can go second, yeah, this is fine. Okay, uh, in that case, uh, can we have Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Howard with his three minute uh, concluding remarks. And as per usual, your time will start when you start speaking and you'll hear the bell as we have done when you have one minute remaining. Okay, great. Um, so I think this has been a wonderful set of reflections from my colleagues and I look forward to hearing um, the questions from the audience. Um, I think what's quite illuminating um, from these reflections is the fact that we're all focused on the practical details of how to design and implement hate speech laws. And that's really where the heart of the disagreement lies. And I think that's exactly the place where it ought to lie. Because if you look at the philosophical literature on hate speech, most of the attention is spent arguing about whether people fundamentally have a moral right um, to propagate hateful views or not. And I think that's not the place we should focus. I think it's indeed on these more thorny questions of implementation. Now, on those questions of implementation, I think it's really important um, not to be excessively hyperbolic in suggesting that Western civilization will collapse just in case we implement hate speech laws. Hate speech laws exist in the preponderance of the world's liberal democracies. Of course, there have been mistaken prosecutions. Of course, we can find examples. And again, Nathan Strassian's book is excellent on this, of cases where the laws have been abused um, and have shut down speech that we wouldn't want to shut down. Um, but we don't see the kind of collapse of the system of free expression in the countries that hate speech laws. On the contrary, we have a robust and healthy culture of public debate. Who's to decide what counts as hate speech? We decide. We are members of a democratic society who get to argue with one another and talk to one another and elect officials and hold officials accountable when they make decisions we disagree with. It's true that part of the point of criminalizing hate speech is to reduce the number of people who are exposed to hateful ideas, to hold speakers accountable so that they're not trying to recruit other people into evil doctrines. But a justified, narrowly tailored system of hate speech laws is never going to shut down um, hateful expression entirely. We will always have access to some amount of hateful expression. Indeed, it seems to me utterly plausible that the best arrangement might be one that relies on a diversity of tools such that in some contexts, for example, on offline contexts where 
that, that are propitious for counter speech. We rely on ongoing conversation to deal with hate speech. But in contexts like social media, where we know that online echo chambers are not propitious for counter speech, in that context, we instead rely on the use of content moderation by social media networks to either restrict or reduce uh, the dissemination of this content. I don't think this involves any kind of clairvoyance or moral arrogance. It involves the commitment to a few certain basic ideas that I submit are beyond reasonable disagreement, that all human beings are equally valuable and that they are entitled not to be killed or shunned or driven out of the community. And I think that basic moral core is what undergirds our commitment to hate speech. Um, five seconds left, I'll make a very small point just reiterating, this is a difficult issue. It's subject to reasonable disagreement. We need to stop casting those that we disagree with as people who are obviously in the grip of an obviously false view and instead realize that this is a difficult issue on which we can have good faith disagreement. Thank you. And in that case, uh, it would, tradition would have been Professor Nadine Strassen, but I think uh, unless, again, any speaker has an objection, uh, Peter, would you like to go next before you leave? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to everyone who has contributed to the debate. Lots of very thoughtful, considered ideas to reflect upon. The two points I'd like to pick up on are Ray Langton's very um, astute observations about Julia Stryker and indeed others who have been able to publish and speak um, lies and fabrications causing great harm and damage. And I agree that it is lies and fabrications that cause the damage in many of these instances. It's the lies of hate speakers that cause so much harm and damage. And therefore, uh, criminalizing the factually inaccurate speech is both more effective and easier to deal with than criminalizing hate. And a lot of hate is based upon factual inaccuracy which I think can be reasonably caught within laws that prohibit such factual inaccuracies. Um, the second point is about unintended consequences. Here in Britain, the Public Order Act was introduced in 1986, ostensibly to combat football hooliganism and street rioting. Very soon afterwards, it became primarily used or frequently used to suppress otherwise legitimate peaceful protests. Um, a young man standing outside the headquarters of Scientology um, with a placard saying Scientology is a dangerous cult was arrested um, on the grounds that he was promoting discord and hatred and division. Um, another instance, um, I was protesting outside parliament with my colleagues from the LGBT plus direct action group outrage in the 1990s, calling for gay law reform. We were arrested under the Public Order Act um, on the grounds that our placards calling for uh, gay law reform would cause offence to members of the public. So my simple point is, the two points, go for criminalisation of inaccurate false claims and allegations and go for a recognition that we have to be mindful of unintended consequences. That I think is the best way to deal with hate speech. Thank you. In that case, I'd like to move to Professor Stanley Fish to make his three minute concluding remarks. Once again, your time will start as soon as you begin to speak. Okay, let me start uh, with Alex's question, uh, which is who's to judge? Uh, ask, I might ungenerously comment uh, with an unbelievable smugness. The answer to that question was given in part by Professor Howard. The people who are to judge are the people who are empowered by elections or appointments to judge, the people whose job it is to judge. They are imperfect persons. No one is waiting for a saint or a person of entirely objective temper to do this work. It's work that has to be done by imperfect human beings like you and me. And it has to be done, I think, in a particular targeted way. The only other point I want to make is in response to something said uh, both by Nadine and Peter, and something with which I agree, 
which is that hate speech laws, however formulated, either in the general way that I deplore or in the specific targeted way I urge, are not going to root out hatred. They are not going to end hatred. They are not going to alter the attitudes of persons who have views that we consider hateful. That is correct. They are not. Nothing is. And certainly not counter speech or counter argument, whatever that is. The problem with counter argument as a way of dealing with these issues as we see them is that it imagines the world as a philosophy seminar or as a dinner party at Princeton or in Cambridge or London, uh, where everyone is sitting around with the proper attitudes, most of them derived from readings of John Rawls. That is not the world. Nothing will root out hate, the hatred which gives rise to speech that we deplore. We won't get at the insides of those people. That's why I say get at their outsides, discomfort them in every way possible, pass laws that hedge them in, uh, shun them, say nasty things about them. Come on, folks. All of you, not all of you, but many of you, are operating on a high level of abstraction of this as if these were moral and philosophical problems. They are not. They are practical and political problems and should be dealt with in that way. The worst mantra that ever came out of free speech polemics is the more speech, the better. Nothing could be further from the truth. Thank you. I'd like now to move to Professor Nadine Strossen to make her uh, three-minute concluding remark. Once again, your time will begin as soon as you begin to speak. Let me begin where my longtime uh, sparring partner, Stanley Fish, has left off. No defender of free speech and opponent of censorship rests on the case that free speech is inevitably going to lead to the truth. Nor did Oliver Wendell Holmes even say that. What he was saying is flawed as it is, free speech is less dangerous than government censorship. And if we look to the history, Stanley, to which you referred in your opening remarks, are we going to say that censorship has protected us from against hatred and against violence and against discrimination and, 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 and not caused great harm to intellectual progress, to the search for truth, to democracy, as well as individual liberty? We need look no further than the example of the Weimar Republic, uh, to which Ray adverted, extremely dear to my heart as the daughter of somebody who was born as a Jew in Berlin in 1922. If I thought that the censorship of the Nazis would have prevented my father's extended family from being murdered, would have prevented my father from being imprisoned in Buchenwald where he almost died, of course I would say that the tests of you know, necessity and proportionality to which Jeff alluded are satisfied. But the truth is uh, the Nazis were prosecuted not only in Nuremberg as Ray alluded to, but also in the Weimar Republic. And many of them, including Streifer, were repeatedly convicted. And guess what? Like the hate mongers of today, who, by the way, I'm not in other ways comparing to the Nazis, but they use the same strategy. They know that attempts to suppress them uh, have a boomerang, forbidden fruits effect, draw to them the attention they crave and sympathy they crave. And the same thing is happening today in the UK, in Germany, throughout Europe, other countries that are enforcing extremely strict anti-hate speech laws. Germany to this day has some of the strictest laws which are more strictly enforced and the rise of anti-Semitism, not to mention uh, and, and not just in speech, but also in actual 
sexual violence, not to mention against refugees and immigrants, is off the charts in Germany, despite the enforcement of these hate speech laws. No wonder, from the pragmatic perspective, Stanley, I agree with you, that's what we have to look at. What works? What is effective? And that's why I think it is so interesting that human rights activists in Germany, in the UK, uh, all over, are, are opposing hate speech laws and, and stressing counter speech and anti-discrimination laws and laws prosecuting those who engage in crimes, not because of some philosophical commitment to free speech. It's completely consistent with the laws of their own country, but strictly from the perspective of what is actually going going to be effective. I'm going to end on a point of agreement if we still have if I still have time and oh, that's sorry. to say okay I agree with Jeff that we have a moral duty. I just don't think it should be a legally enforceable one. Thank you. I'd like now to move to Professor Ray Langton to make the final three minute concluding remark for the proposition. Once again uh, your time will begin as soon as you begin to speak. Thank you. I found this a really interesting discussion and I'm going to focus on the things that I have found we agree on. Uh, so one thing that has struck me about the opposition is that there has been no um, sort of flag waving for an absolute fundamental right that uh, is uh, that is a kind of First Amendment absolutism uh, grounded in something that allows of no exceptions. It is a very pragmatic attitude on both sides of the corridor, so to speak, the virtual corridor. And um, that I find interesting, especially as Jeff has said, um, because the philosophical literature on free speech is entirely dominated by absolutism or if not by absolutism by um, views about how there is a fundamental right that is not simply about getting the system that is going to work the best so if we can agree that we're focusing on what's going to work the best as um, Jeff and Nadine have both said um, then I think that is already progress and it means that there will be hopefully a bit less sort of righteous grandstanding on both sides and a little bit more listening. So um, I also just want to make a, um, a reference to John Stuart Mill before um, closing. John Stuart Mill, um, like everybody in this discussion, emphasized the context sensitivity of hate speech. And that is part of the problem, that is part of what makes it difficult um, to formulate um, laws, but it also uh, means that um, the um, dangerous speech that in one context is not dangerous, in another context can get very dangerous. I'm just thinking of the um, slander against the uh, against the corn dealers, or maybe it wasn't a slander. I want to um, say that we are now in a situation technologically where effectively um, saying something in one context can suddenly explode. In other words, we are we can very quickly become, through, because of the internet, uh, things get propagated way beyond our immediate context. And this means that institutions who we've not been talking about, institutions like the social media companies, have a responsibility not to have algorithms that simply propagate it out of control. So that is a technological issue, uh, which is not about principle, it is about how to solve a problem where the problem is going to be more truth conducive. I was encouraged to hear Peter Tatchell say that part of the problem is about lies and harmful lies. Um, and if we can, um, help find ways to uh, hold the media companies and the social media companies responsible, that will be progress. And looking elsewhere for Sorry. one more mill thought in closing, if it's empirical, let's look around and see what works and that and have, and this is a matter of experiments in living for free, free speech itself. Thank you. Thank you. I now move to Alex J. O'Connor to make the final conclude uh, the final concluding remarks for the opposition. 
Uh, once again, your time will start as soon as you begin to speak. Okay, thank you. I wanted to begin by uh, agreeing with at least two of the other uh, of the, of the proposition speakers that this really, or at least my case, isn't really a, a case against hate speech laws in principle per se, um, but rather a practical one. That is to say, I, I think that any attempt to even distinguish physical from psychological harm is impossible to make, especially on my naturalistic conviction that the mind is at root just as physical as any other part of me. I mean, if I can't hit you, then why can I insult you if pain is just an experience in the brain? What would be the principle different? I think it's a difficult argue to, argument to make. It is the practical elements, almost exclusively, that motivate, therefore, my opposition to the motion, the practical elements alone. And I hope that uh, at least this may please Professor Fish with, I dare say, perhaps this evening's most smug statement of them all, that free speech is somehow not a philosophical or ethical issue, but exclusively a political one, whatever that even means. Um, our first closing speaker said that there have been mistaken prosecutions, um, which I can only uh, uh, assume is a, was a response to my uh, discussion of Oliver Wendell Holmes, um, or, or cases like his. Oliver Wendell Holmes' conviction was not a mistake. It was done intentionally and consciously on the ground that this kind of speech was contrary to the morality and to the security of the United States. If we're in favor of laws, we're going to be in favor of laws that criminalize expressions that are contrary to morality, and we just think that he was wrong or mistaken in that respect about what was actually contrary to real morality, then I think we need an exact specification of what this morality will be and how we can prevent, uh, prevent an abuse of these laws. Now, uh, I, a, a good suggestion was proposed by Dr. Howard, um, a basic moral principle uh, that includes, among other things, an equality of moral consideration for all human beings, and again, among other things, uh, that they deserve not to be killed, and that's another quote, for their immutable characteristics. Um, for this, I, I, I wanted to ask a direct question, and it's genuinely out of interest, um, which is, do, do you therefore think if an example of the kind of moral principle that can justify hate speech is you shouldn't, that everybody should be morally equal and you shouldn't be killed on the basis of immutable characteristics, are you therefore in favor of hate speech laws that criminalize the publication of the Old Testament, which explicitly, as explicitly contradicts that particular moral uh, suggestion as any other example I can think of with a suggestion, not just that homosexuals are morally impure, but that they should be killed because of it. Uh, that would be a direct question that I hope you may have an opportunity to answer because I would be genuinely uh, interested. Um, I think that such a restriction would of course go against the moral principle of religious freedom. And I think that such restrictions on expression inevitably lead to these kinds of paradoxes um, that are best avoided by allowing free expression to continue and to thrive. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now open up the floor for a Q&A session. So you're able here to either pose a comment or rebuttal to what you've just heard. You can make it, just don't make it too long, maybe up to two or three minutes if you want to provide a rebuttal or you can provide uh, a question directed to a particular speaker um, or a particular side to be clear in what you're asking. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my, my point is, do you worry when we try and pick at the very narrow boundaries of what is hate, what isn't hate, we lose our credibility? I was saying in Afghanistan, the Taliban were asked in one of their first press conferences, you're, a remote, you're oppressing the freedom of speech of minority groups, of women, of Hazaras, of Christians, etc. And the Taliban said, we're not doing anything Facebook doesn't. They said, we think they said that word for word. They said, why don't you look at what Facebook's doing in America? They said in America, Facebook removed the pres president of the United States or former president of the United States for hate speech. They said, we are just removing people, quite literally, I suppose. We are removing the ability to speak of people who speak contrary to Islamic values. I mean, I just checked here, 78% of people in Afghanistan support the death penalty for anyone who leaves Islam. It is quite a mainstream view to say, people who say no, people should be allowed to leave Islam, should be, it should be criminalized. Now, my question is, do we, I realize this question is about liberal democracies, but do we not worry that we then lose our ability to tell them to advocate for freedom of speech? And secondly, I'll just add, I don't know if you consider India to be a liberal democracy in this, at least it is on paper with British written constitution. 
In India just this week, I was reading about uh, cricket fans being arrested for celebrating Pakistan's victory. I mean, do not worry about the moral credibility of Skip Ross. Do you give me two minutes? I've been less than two. Sure, I'm happy to say something. I absolutely worry about it. I think we need to be extremely attentive to all the relevant evidence about countervailing effects of these policies. And I think it's important to remember that the mere fact that there will be collateral costs to a particular policy isn't sufficient to invalidate the justification of the policy. All policies have collateral costs. It's about assessing the weight of the collateral costs and whether they're grave enough to outweigh the benefits. And I absolutely grant it as a collateral cost that it might undermine our credibility. Now, if all country, all liberal democracies who have hate speech laws suddenly rescinded those laws, would they therefore be in a better position to convince the Taliban to alter its censorship policies? I doubt it. Um, and so it makes me wonder how great a benefit it would be. But I'm, there's no nothing to be gained by denying that I worry about it because I do. Does anyone have anything further to add to that? I would just perhaps say that it would, at, at the very least, remove their ability to make the uh, make the two cock way, right? It, it may not remove, it may not convince them to, to make a reversal of their policies, but it would at least disempower them from saying, well, look, we're just doing what you're doing too. Because if they're right about that, uh, maybe that is a problem we need to address. Hello, uh, and thank you everybody for speaking. It was really fascinating, particularly as a person who can lean both ways on this issue. My question is for everybody, uh, with specific reference to the mention to Germany. Uh, in Germany, there is a, a ban on unconstitutional organizations such as the National Democratic Party, which is a neo-Nazi party, as well as parties that are explicitly communist. Is there no value in this ban which prevents these anti-democratic organizations from having the capability to subvert democracy through electoral representation? Would this ban on organizations that uh, deal in hate speech is there no value in preventing them from holding such power that could possibly turn Germany into a country with the same ethos as Nazi Germany, when many of these parties invoke the same sorts of um, hateful logic and the same ideology, in some cases, quite literally? Is there no value in maintaining that ban? Thank you. I, you know, I completely agree with Jeff, among others, who's made the and Ray, who's made the point that uh, this is a matter of cost benefit analysis. I confess I'm not a philosopher. I'm not so deeply read in philosophy. And I was shocked to hear that apparently there are philosophers are defending an absolutist position that has never been the position of even the strongest proponent of free speech in the United States, whether I'm talking about a member of the ACLU or a member of the United States Supreme Court. No right is absolute. All rights are subject to restriction. On the same general standard, by the way, Ray, which is reflected in UN human rights conventions and, and instruments, Jeff alluded to it, that is that the restriction is necessary to promote a countervailing goal of compelling importance. And of course, preventing the rise of Nazism satisfies the importance of the goal. The devil is always in the details of is the measure even effective in advancing that goal, let alone necessary. And here to the uh, questioner, I'm sorry, I didn't see your name, so I can't address you by name. Uh, there's a real question how effective these laws are in Germany when I follow the news there with great avidity and concern, as you can imagine, um, that um, there's even been infiltration into the military and intelligence and law enforcement forces of very strong neo-Nazi elements. And it's not only ideology, but gathering caches of weapons and, and plans and plotting conspiracies, not only despite these uh, the, the law that you mentioned, but also uh, very strong enforcement of anti-hate speech laws online as well as offline. So we can't just assume that because there's a law, it's going to be effective. It might actually well be counterproductive as people who are inclined to believe in conspiracy theories and that they're persecuted and that the Jews, Jews you know, and other undesirables are, are controlling everything, uh, that they become more. It's like driving them even further into their rabbit holes. Uh, Ray referred to that, you know, we kick them off the mainstream internet. They, they go to the dark internet where it's much harder 
for legitimate law enforcement to, uh, to, to seek them out. And I, in my book, I quote uh, human rights activists and, and journalists and others in Germany who say, you know, we're really concerned about neo-Nazism, but we would rather use the American way of trusting in a liberal democracy, trusting the people rather than trusting government authority. Um, and uh, I, I, I do want to say one of the, the problems in, in, not, in, in Weimar Republic was laws against actual violence were not enforced. Uh, there's too much actual violence going on in Germany now, and I wish that would be more a subject of attention than uh, what people are saying. Thank you. Does uh, anyone else want to respond to that uh, from our panel? And if you'd like to just speak, otherwise. I'll ask for another question. I think I think uh, Dr. Fish wants to say something here. If we move on. Okay, I think that these bringing up the example of Germany is interesting. Some of you will recall the Goldhagen controversy. That is, a historian named Goldhagen uh, wrote a book arguing that the answer to the question, "What is the?" cause of Nazi Germany and of the Third Reich's regime and policies was something in the character of the German people, uh, which was very much resisted because it, it seemed to bring back a discredited idea and the idea with the idea of national character, uh, which has been regarded as a form of racism um, in some quarters. Well, I am a, myself an unabashed champion of the idea of national character. And I believe that it is, I, I certainly agree with Goldhagen's analysis of why what happened um, in uh, Germany in the 20s, 30s and 40s uh, happened. And I also would use this uh, to argue once again against the general theoretical perspective that I find uh, so uh, futile. That is, what is the alternative to imagining national characters? The alternative is to imagine a general humanity, which is, of course, the cornerstone of liberal democratic thought. And in case anybody had missed it, most of my arguments are arguments against the ideal of liberal democratic thought. Uh, at the end of World War II, uh, or at, let's say 10 years after World War II, I was recalling my classical education and the immortal words of Cato after the third war against Carthage. He said, Carthago delendi est, Carthage must be destroyed. I would have supported uh, an effort to just wipe Germany off the face of the earth. Um, okay, I'm getting pretty conscious of time here again. So uh, if there's anyone who's got any further questions, I want to make sure the floor gets a chance to get involved. Yeah, you've got a question down there. If you want to come down here, it's fine. I think so um, thank you, everyone. It's been an honor to listen to all of your speeches. Wonderful to be in the company of such uh, knowledgeable people, really. So um, an argument or a question brought up by Mr. Alex previously was, who is the person to judge uh, what is a hate speech or not? And then Mr. Stanley Fish said, a decision of whether something is a um, hate speech or not has to be done by imperfect people like you and me. So now I would like to add an additional well condition. Suppose tomorrow a cube fell down on earth and could objectively, absolutely define whether a speech is a hate speech or not. How would this additional condition change how you view this motion? Would you still criminalize this objectively, this objective result or not? And uh, would you be perhaps surprised if a cube were to tell you that most, if not all speeches given by humans ever are actually hate speeches? Thank you. I guess that's directed at Alex. So I guess Alex, you can do that. Well, I can, I can certainly begin by saying it's the very, imperfection um that that uh dr fish mentions that should make us so cautious to grant ourselves the ability to determine what kind of speech should be uh should be permitted 
right? That's, that's the very reason why we wouldn't allow this stuff. If we believed in some kind of um, utopian individual who had some kind of moral clairvoyancy, then of course we would just uh, just turn to them. But I, I must agree with, I think the question is implication um, that it was a strange, perhaps unusual. I, I haven't uh, heard it suggested in quite this manner before that the person who would make this decision would essentially just be some kind of democratic process. It's very clear that democratic proceeds can lead to not just trivially immoral in injunctions, but sometimes society altering, society destroying uh, injunctions. And so long as that's the case, uh, can we really be that confident that the democratic process of admittedly in uh, imperfect individuals is going to be sufficient to uh, inform what kind of speech is allowed to be heard or not? Or are we not better off allowing this kind of stuff to be spoken? I mean, I, I also just wanted to, because it's related, I wanted to briefly bring in what the last questioner said, uh, asking if there's any utility in hate speech laws. I hope I didn't imply that there was no utility in this, that there's no good reason to think that we should be restricting this kind of speech. Of course there is, there's lots of utility in this. There are lots of brilliant reasons why we shouldn't be allowing this kind of speech to be permitted. But the whole case is on the premise um, that although that utility exists, it's outweighed by the dangers involved. It's, a, it's not a cost worth paying. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a fantastically interesting question to say that if we did somehow achieve some objectivity on this issue, if God himself came down from the heavens and told us what was right, um, would we suddenly change our criterion of what's allowed to be said and what's not? And if we would, doesn't that just mean our criterion wasn't right in the first place? Um, but I mean, you said the question was directly to me. I think it might have actually been more directed to, uh, pro to Dr. Fish. So I'll, I'll suppose I'll hand it to him. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, first of all, the idea of a cube or something descending uh, has some similarities to the hopes pinned on the a concept of artificial intelligence. And in fact, when he's pushed to the wall, as he often is and should be, uh, Zuckerberg uh, responds with a faith uh, in the future development of artificial intelligence. And it's always a future development of artificial intelligence. I tell you right now, artificial intelligence will never succeed in its task. On the other hand, God, if he revealed himself to take up uh, Alex's uh, point, would indeed resolve these questions. Um, uh, but as many uh, have said, um, A, God hasn't spoken to me, and B, if he's spoken to me, he seems to have spoken differently to others, uh, so that a short of revelation, uh, which, we, which we may hope for um, in another better, eternal world, we are left with the political process. And that leads me to my response to what Alex just said. How much confidence in the political process can we have knowing that we are all um, imperfect um, and uh, ambitious for our own views um, and, and, and projects? To which I would respond, as opposed to what? That is, I'm certainly willing to acknowledge that the political process uh, has its flaws and will produce uh, outcomes that many of us would de be deplored. But what else do we look to? And what I hear uh, from the, the standard free speech uh, polemic community is that we, that we look to certain uh, abstractions and certain general truths, or at least to the hope to try to identify them. I don't believe they exist, or if they exist, they are beyond our kin. I don't believe we could possibly identify them. I believe that attempting to identify them gets us back in the same kind of political struggles. So all the while, my argument has been a simple one. Politics is the only realm in which anything can be done. And it is the area in which we should try to do work, and sorry, try sorry. to do work we think is right. Thank you. I'm pretty keen again to get the audience involved. So um, sorry if I'm not getting around to all of you, but um, yeah, I want to move on to like the next question or if anyone else has further comments, uh, do you want to come up? All right, come on. First, thank you very much uh, for speaking to us all today. That was very enjoyable and informative. Uh, my question is uh, broad and, and two pronged. 
Thus far, the discussion has centered along pragmatics, how pragmatically we can mitigate the effects of hate speech. And we've entrusted that uh, to democratically elected politicians. But how do we grapple with the fundamental aim and motive of politicians, which is to maintain their own power, to be reelected uh, in a democratic society? What happens then when we have an extremist government like the United States very nearly had in the last few months that can turn our double-edged sword against us and start to dismantle liberal democracy in the name of suppressing views that they consider to be either hateful or at the very least not politically expedient to their aims and therefore can be criminalized and prosecuted um, under loose interpretations of the proposed hate speech legislation. Well, that's exactly why uh, those of us who strongly defend civil liberties, including free speech, do not allow absolute power to uh, either democratic majorities or the officials who are accountable to them. The very idea of a fundamental human right, whether it's protected under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights internationally or under the Bill of Rights in the United States, is that there are some rights that are so fundamental that no government may take them away from anyone, even a small, embattled, unpopular individual or minority group. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, said it very well when it said, you know, your freedom of speech and other fundamental rights are not subject to the ballot box. And that's why, you know, in some ways the question is, whom do we fear more? Whom do we distrust more? And unlike Stanley, as a civil libertarian, I distrust uh, majorities and the governments and to which the, the, that are accountable to them more when it comes to fundamental individual rights. And that's why we see over and over again how all of these laws, including laws against disinformation, by the way, so I disagree with my partner, Peter, that we should allow government to suppress that either because it has the same fundamental problem. The pattern is disproportionately and predictably that those laws are enforced against minority interests and voices whether they be ethnic minorities, whether they be political minorities, whether they be economic minorities. Um, thank you. I'd like to see if uh, Professor Wei Lang can get involved. I don't think you've had a say on a question yet. So I'd like to think a little bit about the we in when we're thinking about this, we wouldn't find this a cost worth paying. This has come up a few times. Um, uh, we think that th there are some rights that are so important that it shouldn't be interfered with. So um, whenever we have, whenever we, ha whenever there is rights talk, um, there is also implicitly duties talk. So your right is someone else's duty. Uh, that's all it is. So when we are saying uh, you have a right uh, to say whatever hateful and hate provoking thing you like, uh, because the alternative is too costly for us. Um, we need to think about um, who is paying the cost. Um, and I know, uh, and Nadine has spoken very eloquently about the ways in which things backfire and damage um, and harm um, minorities and so the way in which rules can be used um, in ways that hurt the very people they were supposed to be protecting and that is a, something to be very concerned about but I haven't heard enough about you know what is what are we going to do about the uh, sort of collateral damage if you like to the principles that you're endorsing the um, migrant communities that are targeted by anti-migrant hate um, the uh, women that are targeted by misogynistic, uh, violent pornography. The, um, that's another topic which I shouldn't have brought in, but it's one that I am interested in elsewhere. Um, the, um, the particular uh, sort of racial groups, the, we don't generally just hold, wave our hands and say, oh, it's all so difficult. Uh, it's also difficult. We can never. It's too difficult to define anything. This debate isn't about formulating a piece of legislation, challenge, being challenged to form some definition. This debate is about 
what we are going to do about the problem of the propagation of hate by technological means enabled by profit-driven corporations um, and uh, whose result is the suffering of some of the most vulnerable people, many of whom are not represented on this particular panel. And so that's who I would like to bring into the conversation. And I know it's hard for us to do given our situation, but that's who I would like us to pay some attention to. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any further questions? If not, then we'll proceed to do a final vote. Thank you very much for uh, your speeches. I just wanted to um, talk about the, uh, I think it was mentioned that, um, so we can't, uh, we, can, we can never enforce these laws because they, each uh, person in the judicial process from the policeman to, to the prosecutors would have a own discretionary outlook on uh, what constitutes as hate speech. But isn't that the same with the whole of, of all of our laws, surely every single law which we have, the judge would have to see what the reasonable person would do and use, um, you know, a common uh, judgment to, to say whether uh, that was reply or not. So why do we just not trust the judges to make the right decisions when it comes to hate speeches, when, you know, the same measure of reasonable and uh, as they would apply to all laws would have to be applied here as well. May I say, speaking from the United States, that is a very serious problem. Every study that's been done of how the laws against the war on drugs and other criminal laws are enforced show that they're disproportionately enforced against mostly young, dark-skinned men. And so the task is to limit as strictly as you possibly can. You, I don't think you would ever want to completely eliminate discretion in enforcing the law because that can become too harsh. So we have to strike this delicate balance between the rule of law and the rule of equity. We do want to some extent to empower judges to take individual facts and circumstances into account, but not too much because then it becomes latitude that can be enforced even if unconsciously. Um, systematically against certain minority populations. By the way, studies in my country have shown that many laws are disproportionately uh, enforced against women too, those who, who lack political power, even if they may be a numerical majority. And that's why I'm all in favor of the current uh, status of, of, of unprotected speech in the United States, which is hateful speech may be punished if you can show a tight and direct causal connection between the speech and some imminent specific harm, such as intentional incitement of imminent violence or a true threat, that cabins the discretion. It doesn't completely eliminate it, but it's a wide, wide open discretion when you get to the kind of definition with all due respect we had in tonight's debate or some of the other definitions that have been uh, brought out in today's debate. Thank you for that. I, I noticed we still have a tiny bit of time, so this will actually be the final question. So if anyone's got a final question, then they can go ahead. Uh, okay. And then after that, we'll do a, uh, a vote to see how the numbers have changed. Do you consider that it's quite probable that the demand for the institution that creates this mechanism of enforcing the law can potentially make it more just in the future. While if we do not set this task in front of them by actually not placing this need to enforce the law, there will be no pressure on improving this body that decides uh, what should be restricted and what not. And considering the obvious harms of hate speech, maybe it is better to sacrifice some short-term harm for long-term benefit if we consider that there is a possibility of the improvement. So is it a real case or we should not be so optimistic about uh, institutions improving their mechanisms? And in very specifics, we'd like to do that. Um, maybe to Alex, because uh, I think that was one of the points addressed in his speech. I'm, I'm very, I'm sorry. I, I kind of uh, struggled to hear you a little there. Would you be able to maybe repeat yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, if we actually decide to reinforce this law, there will be a demand for the institutions to be more perfect because there will be public pressure in cases when people will identify that, oh, it's unjust to enforce it in this case. So uh, perhaps gradually these institutions will actually become more perfect and 
can we actually believe in that and then maybe like compare to the actual harm of hate speech and try to understand that this demand solemnly can actually make up for some good results in the future while yeah yeah, yeah I, I, I think I, I think I see what you're asking I think that's a good that's a good question it is the point that of course I mean what if one of uh, this side's points is that the, the institution doing the prohibiting is going to be an imperfect one and there's this suggestion here I believe that you're making that through uh, public criticism of those institutions those institutions will improve if that is the case I would consider it as one of the one of the kind of positive net utility points in favor of these laws that still needs to be balanced against the consequences. But I would also caution you to think that if the thing that's being suggested by this institution is that this speech is dangerous and harmful and hateful and needs to be criminalized, then criticizing them for doing so is going to be a difficult thing to do. Um, not just because those kinds of criticisms might themselves be considered to be hateful and offensive and therefore be shut down by the same law and not allowed to flourish and therefore uh, change the institution, but also socially. Uh, you can imagine a world in which everybody around you and, and the law itself is condemning something for being horribly immoral and offensive. And you're also out there thinking, well, maybe I'm not so sure about this, but for you to stand up and to say that you think that this might not uh, be the way that we should be criminalizing hate speech, to say that this person that everybody is, uh, you know, metaphorically hanging in the street um, doesn't deserve the hatred they're getting. That can be a very brave social thing to do. And I, I think um, we shouldn't be so optimistic about the human spirit in situations like that, where everybody seems to be uh, against them. So I, I don't think that overall that would be the expected outcome. I don't think we can just trust that the public will hold these institutions accountable and then they'll just somehow like improve and improve because the very criticisms that the public can make are the things that will be, uh, will, will be criminalized um, down the line as well. Thank you. And thank you to all of our speakers. And I would just like to now do a final vote same in the same manner that we did at the beginning. So remember the motion tonight was this house believes it is right for a liberal democracy to criminalize hate speech. So if you uh, support the proposition here tonight, would you please raise your hand? Okay, and if you support the opposition here tonight, can you please raise your hand? Thanks, and if you abstain, can you please raise your hand? Right, maybe I'm getting this wrong, but I'd say that's edged out for the opposition. Oh, yeah, I think you got more support as well, opposition this time. Okay, so in that case, I'd like to thank you all for attending the debate, both the audience and all of the speakers. Thank you very much. And I hope it's been an insightful, productive debate. And well, with that, I think that will conclude this public debate. Thank you. Oh. Thank you.